Well, good morning, beautiful Lilydalians. What a privilege it is to come to you in your homes over breakfast, maybe as Darren suggested. And I'd just like to invite you to have a word of prayer as we open the word of God together this morning. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your many blessings. And this morning as we spend time at home, it probably doesn't feel a lot like blessings to many of us. But Lord, you are good. You are so good, and we can trust you. And um, I remember Darren saying last night that he has a theory about the way Christians look at COVID as a whole lot different than what the world does when they go into panic buying and panic everything when these things of uncertainty come. We don't have to be like that. And your word today speaks to us of freedom and what we have in you, and we are so blessed by it. So as we open your word, may we... We, we absolutely relish it, drink it in, and be changed and blessed and transformed by it. I pray in your precious name. Amen. So, Mikey's story was wonderful in that it talked about an Old Testament story of freedom. And it was physical. The Israelites were trapped in physical slavery. They weren't allowed to go anywhere. They weren't allowed to do anything. Their burdens were heavy and hard. And it was very physical. Their bodies struggled under the weight you know it said that they were probably very instrumental in building all the great structures of Egypt and so it was heavy and hard work and then they are released by the blood of the lamb that we see in the Passover story that the angel of death passed over them and then we come into this New Testament time and by the the blood of the lamb we're set free not just physically from captive life of slavery, but a slavery that encompasses our very spirit and our soul. And so in this beautiful letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians, he's re-establishing this freedom. And you saw in the video that we don't have to be encumbered by all our sins. We don't have to be weighed down by by lust and jealousy and gossip and those things because we are, through the blood of the Lamb, set free and so I I just want you to um, open your Bibles at Galatians because as Darren again explained in the Lilydale link we're going to go chronologically through the letters of Paul and we think that between 48 AD and 50 AD Paul penned this to the church churches of Galatia now if you remember from the missionary journeys of Acts and I'm so grateful that we did Acts just not so long ago that um, Galatia was a a province a Roman province in the middle of modern day Turkey where the churches of Lister and um, Antioch and um, Derby those churches were in that group and Paul traveled through there and he planted churches through there so he's writing this letter to this little group of churches that he had come to love. But in many of Paul's letters, they're kind of gushy, aren't they? You know, it's oh, good on you and wonderful and praise you. I praise God for you every day. But in the letter to the Galatians, instead of his kid gloves on, he's got boxing gloves and he's ticked. He's quite annoyed at what's going on. And, and we discover that what's happening in Galatia is that their freedom is being taken and we will discover that their freedom is not being taken by slavers or anything else but by Judaizers. Now we've heard before of these these people, we, we heard about them in Acts 15. If you remember, Paul and Silas were quite upset because they were going and converting Gentiles to, to the, the gospel and they had these fabulous believers in Jesus and it was all going really well and then somebody was following them around saying you need to be circumcised and you need to get the Jewish law to be saved and so they took this issue back to Jerusalem to the apostles back there to James who was Jesus brother who was running the church in, at Jerusalem and Peter was with them and they called, called everybody together and they had the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council where they decided let's not Let's not make it a burden for people to come to Jesus. And they made laws about um, sexual corruption and also eating laws so that they could, the Jews and the Gentiles could actually dine together. So it was about food, food that was strangled. or So they, they made just four, just four laws. 
And once again, Paul is annoyed that these people, these Judaizers, Judaizers have travelled into the region of Galatia and are spoiling the churches that he's planted there. So these people were legalistic. So they believed in Jesus, but they believed that you had to keep the Jewish law. So very similar to what we dealt with at the Jerusalem Councilor Council, um, they were following following Paul around and, and going to his churches and saying, you know Paul? Yes, we know Paul. And, um, do you know the gospel? Yes, we know the gospel. And But Paul hasn't told you enough. He hasn't told you the whole, the whole bit. There's more. And any time you try to add anything to Jesus, you know that there's danger. That no longer is the gospel. So they were parasites. Paul was going around doing all the work. He would go into virgin territory and spread the gospel and work hard and labour for these beautiful souls. And he had come to love them and cherish them. So these parasites would not do the work for themselves, but they were parasitic in that they would come along after his hard labour and start to undermine his teaching and say, you need to do this. And so legalism was creeping in to the Galatians. And... It was quite nasty because 2,000 years ago in the, in the rabbinic or, you know, the, the, the rabbis actually made statements that the Gentiles were only created to feed the fires of hell. And, and you think, oh, that's not very nice. But that's what they thought. They thought you had to be Jewish to be saved. And they had this saying, and you might recognise parts of it, that there is joy in heaven when God obliterates one sinner from the face of the earth. Does it sound a little bit similar to what Jesus said? Because he said, there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents. And so you can see the contrast here of this love for the lost as opposed to this awful, awful, awful legalism that was creeping in. So as we move into Galatians, and it's, it's quite a strong book, um, Martin Luther it was one of his favourites. He, um, he said it was his letter. He was married to it. I don't know how his wife would feel about that, but it's a compact version of all the righteousness by faith issues that became such a key interest um, in the Reformation, but it's compacted into just six chapters, so it's quite short in comparison, and it's divided probably into three parts. The first part is Paul talks about his personal journey and who he is and his authority in Christ. And then it goes into um, chapters three and four, and that's very doctrinal, and he goes into the doctrine about righteousness by faith. And then out of the next two, chapters five and six, it's practical, how you should live out of this freedom. And my theme today is about the freedom that this brings. And I'm just wondering, if you're sitting there feeling trapped today, I think this is a word for this very moment. Don't feel trapped, because you are free. Do you know that no one can take your eternal life from you? No one can take your destiny? No one can steal your salvation? They might be able to keep you at home, but they can't steal the elements that are your fibre for eternity away from you. And so in that, we need to celebrate a beautiful freedom. So let's begin our journey into Galatians. If you opened your, your book of Galatians, we'll, we're in chapter 1 to start with. And Paul makes an impassioned plea. And let's start at verse 6. We have to scoot through because I'm going to do an overview of the, the beautiful bits of freedom that we have. So let's read verse 6. And I told you he's wearing boxing gloves for this letter. So he goes, I'm shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the one who called you in the grace of Christ. I'm frankly astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel. gospel. That is a fake gospel that is simply not true. There is only one gospel, the gospel of the Messiah, yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse you with lies. So the Galatians had heard probably the best New Testament teacher other than Jesus himself preach 
of the glory and the joy and the freedom of the gospel. And very quickly, he finds out that they have listened to the Judaizers um, talking that they needed law, that they needed to have more than Jesus. That's a frightening thought, to want more than Jesus, isn't it? So when Jesus was crucified, there's an interesting thing. It's like you kind of reverse what happens. Can you imagine if we redid the Exodus, Exodus story and they got out and they got as far as the Red Sea maybe and they saw the sea open up and God reveal his glory to them and then they go, oh, you know what, let's go home. After they see that sea open, they decide to go back to Egypt into the arms of the people that pursuing them and who were who were treating them so badly. And, and I was reading Josephus' history, and it says that in the New Testament, after Jesus was crucified, they had sacrifices back in the temple again. So if you recall, when Jesus was crucified, the veil to the most holy was ripped from the top to the bottom. It was a very thick veil. It was a very tall temple. It had to be done by hands that were not human. And so... When it was ripped open, for them to go back to having sacrifices and go back to that sacrificial system again, they would have had to sew up the veil. Can you imagine having God rip open the veil and reveal himself in his glory and say, open all areas, open all access. You have direct access to me. Don't change that. I go, no, oh, you know what? I think we'll just sew it up and hide the presence of God again. Can you imagine? And that's exactly what the Galatians were doing. They were giving up their freedom and sowing back the veil that kept them trapped. Who would do that? And then if we read in verse 8, and he speaks really strongly. He's going, this is nuts that you would give up your freedom and this direct access to grace that you have. And he says, Anyone who comes to you with a different message than the grace gospel that you have received will have the curse of God come upon them. That's pretty strong stuff. For even if we or an angel appeared before you to give you a different gospel than what we have already proclaimed, God's curse will be upon them. I will make it clear anyone, no matter who they are, that brings you a different gospel than the grace gospel that you have received, let them be condemned or cursed. In the history of the churches, we know that some religions have been based on an angel showing up with new revelation. It's almost like Paul was warning into the future, don't be changed from what, the, what Jesus has done here. You can't add anything more to Jesus. You can't work your way to heaven. It is impossible so I, th I just think of, of, you know, some of the apparitions that have appeared and the face of Jesus in a tortilla and all the things where people get misled and all the things that the wow factor can, can lead people astray. Paul's almost warning, don't, don't go there. You've been given freedom. The law is now being taken care of and you can live in freedom. Let's go to verse 16. And he says, we, we know full well that we don't receive God's perfect righteousness as a reward for keeping the law, but by the faith of Jesus, the Messiah, his faithfulness, not ours, has saved us. And we have received God's perfect righteousness. Now we know that God's, God accepts no one by the keeping of religious laws. Verse 17, if we are those who desire to be saved from our sins through our union with the anointed one, does that mean our Messiah promotes our sins? If we still acknowledge that we are sinners, how absurd. For if I, if I start over and reconstruct the old religious system, so up the veil, that I have torn down with the message of grace, I will appear to be one who turns his back on the truth. But because the Messiah lives in me, I now die to the law's domination over me so that I can live for God. Paul, like, it's grace all packed up. And it's not saying that 
Do you become liberal and unruly and do anything you want with this message of grace, this law? No. No, you don't. Because what the law does is it points fingers. If you remember, it was put there to amplify. You heard Graham play with his guitar. Now, he had an amplifier here. If he played it, you might hear a little bit because it's a semi-acoustic, but um, when you put it through the amplifier, you hear the whole thing. So the law's given, so we can actually see how sinful we are. And then it talks further on that any part of it, if we try to keep any part of it, we're then trapped in it. And that's not what we're told to do. We're told to be free, not to be liberal. But the law points the finger where it is grace enables. And that, that just blows me away. In chapter 3, I just want to read chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. And we're in the transition when he starts to talk about some of the doctrinal issues and he says, what has happened to you Galatians to be acting so foolishly? Why would you give up your grace? Why would you give up your freedom? You must have been under an evil spell. Didn't God open your eyes to see the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? Wasn't he revealed to you as the crucified one? So answer me this. Did the Holy Spirit come to you as a reward for keeping all the Jewish laws? No. You received him as a gift because you believed in the Messiah. Your new life in the anointed one. One began with the Holy Spirit giving you new birth. In other words, you're not under the law. Why then would you so foolishly turn from living in the Spirit by trying to finish your own works? Have you endured, endured all these trials and persecutions for nothing? Let me ask you again, what does the lavish supply of the Holy Spirit in your life and the miracles of God's tremendous power have to do with keeping religious laws? The Holy Spirit is poured out upon us through the revelation and the power of faith, not by keeping the law. Abraham, our father of faith, led the way as our pioneering example. He believed God and the substance of his faith released God's righteousness to him. So he's referring back to Revelation, uh, sorry, to Genesis. Um, Because Abraham wasn't a Jew. That wasn't even invented when he was called um, from the land of the Chaldees. So he was, what would that be, Iraqi? Iraqi. Um, And and he wasn't circumcised until he was, I think, 99. And so at the point when he was called, he was in his 80s. And if you look at Genesis 15, he's just had a, a very trying time and he's sitting in his tent quite upset. And he says, "My, I don't have any descendants. All, all that I am is going to go to a distant relation, a relation from Damascus. Um, what are you going to do for me, God? And so God says, all right, Abraham, get out of the tent and I want you to come outside and look up. And he says, look up at the stars of the sky and if you can count them, just see if you can count them. And you, you, have you ever tried to count the, the stars in the sky? And we're, we're talking about out in the open, um, you know, when you go Pathfinder camping and the skies are just so clear and wonderful. And there he's looking up and he's trying to look at the stars of the sky and count them and he goes, if you can count them but that will be your descendants. And the Hebrew uses the word like amen. So at that point, Abraham believes what God has to say to him. And so that is accounted, that belief in what God said is accounted to him as righteousness. It's not a big thing. If we break it all down, there's two religions in the world. And you can say, no, Faye, you're wrong, there's lots. But there's two real religions. There's the religion of human achievement or the religion of divine accomplishment. Which do you belong to? Which do you belong to? It's easy for us to creep to the legalistic mode. Like, um, I grew up in as an Adventist and, you know, we would, you know, Sabbath was very sacred and we would rush around and uh, it was a day of not doing a lot of things, and, and people would help you keep it. You shouldn't do that on Sabbath. 
you shouldn't wear that, you shouldn't do that. And, and you can see the finger pointing. Now look, they were great, lovely souls who probably hadn't really looked at the word, probably hadn't spent enough time in Galatians. But I pose this to you. When, when Jesus, when God gives you a holiday that says you can say no to everybody but me, that's freedom. Sabbath is freedom, isn't it? Ladies, we don't even have to do the housework. If the kids whinge, you can, it's Sabbath, I'm resting. Um, the beds can be unmade. The food's usually prepared. It's a day when we can say no to everybody except God. It's, it's amazing freedom. So all the things that we think um, make us good at being Christians or good at being Adventists, if we're good at being Adventists, all those rules, are they going to change our relationship? No. No, we live in freedom and everything we keep, every, every habit that we have should be based in this beautiful freedom and done purely to glorify God. In verse 10 he says, If you choose to live in bondage under the legalistic rule of religion, you live under the law's curse, for it is clearly written, utterly cursed is anyone who fails to practice every detail required in the law. So he's going, you, you just can't do it. Don't, don't get into it. Don't even... He's almost saying if you start, if you get into that and start examining yourself, you'll get into the finger pointing and, and, and this is the truth. And then we see in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we know it so well, for God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we would... We who did not know righteousness might become righteousness of God through our union with him. The law was to show us sin. As I said, it amplifies it. So why was it given? In verse 19, he tells us. It was given to be, a, they use a Greek word, which is pedagogus, and it's to be a babysitter. So it was to keep the Israelites safe knowing what they were supposed to do until the seed arrived, which was Jesus, to break all that encumbered them. And Paul loves to use that, that word, the yoke, doesn't he? That, that yoke. And, and he, he says the law is like a yoke. And then we move into the second part of the doctrine and he talks about all the doctrine and he ties all that in. And it's just beautiful. Please spend time reading Galatians because it is absolutely amazing. I just want to read to you um, verse 1 of chapter, chapter 5. You know this bit so well. Let me be clear. The anointed one has set us free. Not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish the truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Do not sew the veil back up. Paul tells you, if you think there is a benefit in circumcision and Jewish regulations, then you are acting as though Jesus the anointed was not enough. Is Jesus enough for you? Is his grace and what he did for you enough? Grace motivates you. The law can command you, as I said. It can point the fingers and give you directions. But the new covenant enables you. Think of abilities to do stuff you could never do before. Ryan's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and what you can do once you have said yes to Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in you and enables you to do amazing things. Therefore, stand fast in freedom. Don't give it up. Don't get all weird about it. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever been given a really expensive present that you just couldn't handle, like a car, and you, you don't know what to do with that. And you're always trying to do things to pay back. Um, I've had amazing gifts given to me by friends and I'm just so humbled and you're always trying to do something to earn it or, or make yourself feel better for the great gift that you've received. But it's impossible. And if you do that to someone else, 
I used to do funny little things where I would, you know, often when I was going over to Gilson way over the other side, I'd be, I knew I would have to sit in traffic for probably two hours to get back to Berwick. So I would pop into McDonald's and get a frappe. I was a bit addicted to the things. And then I would just say, oh, and can I pay for the guy behind me's meal? Whatever they have. And, and it was really funny what happened. You'd get out on the highway and they'd be trying to catch up with you. <laughs> on the road and, <laughs> and they couldn't just take it it was a really interesting exercise and it wasn't like you know it would vary between I think the worst was about $12 but you know it wasn't like getting a car or getting salvation or grace or mercy or the gift of eternal life but this person felt hard to receive we're hardwired to believe that we have to earn everything we get but that's not what this is saying. The, the kingdom life that God gives is nothing like what we're used to. Paul's saying to these guys, you've been given the most amazing gift. You are made to be set free. Not set free to abuse anybody. Not set free to do your own will and just be crazy and rude and nasty. But set free to be mine. And he talks about sonship and he talks about family. You know, sonship is based in family. Family is based in love and trust and feeling like you belong. And just because you have a whoopsie or you do something wrong in your family, it doesn't disconnect you from that group. And that's what Jesus gave us on the cross, that ability to say we belong. It's not what I do. I'm not earning everything by every single step of what I do, every little law I keep. I'm here and I belong and I live in freedom and I am loved and I am worthy and I am valued only because of him. So like the crazy guy trying to catch up with me on the freeway, waving to thank me for a $6 whatever I bought him from McDonald's. Can you give just amazing praise to a God that just worked so hard, so hard that he gave his one and only son to set you free and you are free indeed and, and to live in that relationship and to breathe him in and to just know that everything that we do is is covered by him and he empowers us to share what we have and to live in joy and no matter what storm's going on around us whether we're stuck at home or whatever no one can steal this freedom from you so is that worth praising for i believe it is